How resistant we are to the suggestion that our greatest attribute, rational thinking, is not a default setting for humans, but our cognitive processes are largely unconscious, and we have to work vigilantly to establish and maintain logical thought. When people like Jung first suggested it, based on his research, it was not an easy sell. But now we have a, a growing flood of neuroscientific data which suggests that a lot of cognitive processes go on beneath the level of our awareness and, just, and shows just how complex our thinking is, influenced by not only rational, logical decisions, but unconscious instinct and archetype. In this video, I want to explain in more detail Jung's contribution to this understanding of the psyche, which is increasingly being verified. It's not just believers in the supernatural who feel the numinous, charged experience of objects and events, which, on the face of it, are simply objects and events. We all experience, at various levels of intensity, some sort of spontaneous feelings, emotions of elation, attachment, awe, dread towards objects, events, people in our lives. Few of us are unmoved by some monuments like war memorials, graves of our heroes, festivals and ceremonies like birthdays and anniversaries, national days and other important tribal functions like the Olympics or the World Cup. We feel the mysterious thrill of losing identity in the crowd when we are members of a, a large group with a single intent, but on the face of it these are simply objective realities. How is it that we can invest them with an emotional charge, a power which in some cases can profoundly move us, even transform us, that they don't have without our projecting the significance onto them? Projection is the confusion of subject and object. Some inner part of ourselves is perceived outside of us. The object mirrors back to us an image originating within ourselves. What was just rock, wood or action? becomes as if sacred because of our human imagination. Anthropologist Claude Levy Brule coined the term participation mystique to refer to the symbolic life which precedes or accompanies all mental and intellectual differentiation. As Jung writes, the further we go back into history, the more we see personality disappearing beneath the wrappings of collectivity. And if we go right back to primitive psychology, we find absolutely no trace of the concept of an individual. Instead of individuality, we find only collective relationship, or what Levy Brühl calls participation mystique. The objective and subjective components of the experience are fused in a way that we confuse our own subjective elements, unconscious stuff, which is often mythological, archetypal, with objects, including other persons and situations. It's not a matter of choice, it's unconscious. The way our subjective minds interact or connect with so-called objective reality. We see it more easily in others, but we must own it in ourselves. We only need to think of the personality we project onto our favorite possessions, say a car, the human attributes we project onto our pets, our superstitions around lucky numbers, the charisma we project onto authority figures or celebrities. Any time we find ourselves relating to an object in an emotional way, there is a subjective link with some degree of fusion of subject and object to be found. In each of these cases, our psyche projects an imaginative something of ourselves participating in the object through what Jung termed fantasy thinking. Fantasy thinking is primarily an autonomous subjective process. It represents our internal experiences linked by patterns of association rather than logical concepts. We find these running out of control in cases of schizophrenia, for example, but all of us stand in this world of fantasy thinking, and not only in our nightly dreams. As Jung said, any lessening of interest or the slightest fatigue is enough to put an end to the delicate psychological adaptation to reality and replace it by fantasies. We wander from the topic and let our thoughts go their own way. If the slackening of attention continues, we gradually lose all sense of the present, and fantasy gains the upper hand. Our defence against fantasy thinking is objective consciousness. 
It seems to have emerged late in our evolution as we began to consciously differentiate between I and not I. In fact, a surprising proportion of our thinking has components of fantasy thinking, of course unrecognized, with a tenuous distinction between subject and object. With directed or objective thinking, projections are still made, but we can, with effort, logically think through them. It is characterized by thinking in words and language rather than images and symbols. This language-based thinking is social, an instrument of culture, forcing logical, directed thinking to be an adaptation through culture rather than through psyche. Jung notes that directed logical thinking is reality-oriented, a thinking as contrasted to fantasy thinking that is adapted to reality operating with speech elements for the purpose of communication. It's difficult and exhausting. On the other hand, fantasy thinking, he says, is effortless, working as it were spontaneously with the contents ready at hand and guided by unconscious motives. The one produces innovations and adaptations, copies reality and tries to act upon it. The other turns away from reality, sets free subjective tendencies and as regards outer adaptation, is unproductive. He says, The objective mind is ceaselessly employed in stripping experience of everything subjective and in devising formulas to harness the forces of nature and express them in the best way possible. The fantasy form, if not constantly corrected by adaptive thinking, is bound to produce an overwhelmingly subjective and distorted picture of the world. Clearly, Jung saw the dangers of fantasy thinking. In the world of our ancestors, virtually everything was regulated by fantasy thinking, and their projections were an obstacle to innovation. Objective consciousness, though, allows us to innovate, to vary in central patterns, to relate to the objective world once our projections are withdrawn. The object is demythologized and we make the first steps towards science by creating an objective relationship with the world rather than a subjective participation in it. Historically, this is represented by the Enlightenment when the veil of medieval sacramentality was penetrated by the light of rationality. And then over the next 300 years, our world became increasingly demythologized. And in demythologizing the outer world, we demythologize ourselves as well. But objective consciousness, while freeing us from the tyranny of projection, exacts the price of an imprisoned imagination. Many of the linkages we have with the objective world are lost and it becomes objectified, and we become orphans in it, alienated. Is the truth presented by objective thinking always enhanced without this contribution from our unconscious psyche? without our imagination? Must we purge our psyche of emotional impact in order to avoid the dangers of fantasy thinking? This is a modern dilemma. In my next video, I'll cover Jung's approach to this. That with too little objective consciousness, we live unconsciously with the loss of soul that makes us crazy, losing our objectivity as we construe everything in a mythological or religious fantasy out of touch with reality. But, with too much objectivity, we change tyrannies. With a loss of imagination, we are alienated, neurotic, out of touch with a life-giving source that not only balances our psyches, but which gives us access to a sense of meaning and relatedness. When we no longer feel the tug of emotion towards the object, something essential is lost. Is this, then, our only choice, or is there a middle course between the horns of the theistic-atheistic dilemma? in Jungian thought. That next time.